Hello, and welcome back to Helsinki on the Hill, a series of conversations hosted by the United States Helsinki Commission on human rights and comprehensive security in Europe and beyond. I'm your host, Alex Tierski. Listeners, as I prepared for this conversation, I was talking to a, a brand new intern in our office about how excited I was to record this particular episode. This uh, new intern, first day, said to me, oh, yeah, I, I heard something about that. You're going to be interviewing a couple of generals, right? That should be really cool. And I said, that's not quite it exactly. I explained to him that, in fact, this episode uh, was going to feature the secretaries general of two really important parliamentary assemblies. Well, it was pretty obvious that my response didn't completely clear things up for him, and we're going to fix that today. This episode is going to be a great one. Today, we intend to peel back the curtain on the work of two key institutions, institutions that, despite being poorly understood, even by those who follow foreign affairs pretty closely, have a really remarkable influence on a huge range of issues on the global agenda. Today, we plan to learn everything there is to know about the parliamentary assemblies of NATO and the OSCE. And we have with us literally the two most qualified and best placed individuals in the world to talk to us about these assemblies in the studio with me today. I have on my right Roberto Montella. He is the Secretary General of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly based in Copenhagen. Roberto, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Alex, for having me on the show. To my left is Ruxandra Popa. She is the Secretary General of the Parliamentary Assembly of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, also known as the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, based in Brussels. Ruxandra, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alex. It's, it's great to be here with, with you and with Roberto. Terrific. Okay, let's get back to the new intern in our office, just out of school, first day on the job. How do you explain your job to him? Roberto, why don't you start us off? Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, so this is a challenge I always get, you know, also when I, I go back to Italy to see my parents in southern Italy, <laughs> my uh, uh, my friends say, Roberto, but what is it that you do? We see these photos on Facebook, but uh, you speak to interesting people, but what is it exactly that you do? Yeah. So it's difficult to explain. Uh, but um, I lead a staff of uh, 30 people between Copenhagen and uh, Vienna. It's a small staff uh, at the service of uh, parliamentarians, uh, uh, 57 countries, uh, 323 members of parliament representing one billion citizens. Uh, these members of parliament dedicate time uh, to uh, the work of the OSC uh, and uh, they uh, request us to create for them the conditions to be able to work in conflict prevention, in conflict uh, resolutions, in institution building, democracy building, uh, dialogue. So I would describe my job as uh, the civil servants who creates the condition to allow these members of parliament to engage in these issues and to engage in dialogue with uh, the members of parliament. Okay, okay. Ruxandra, how, how similar or different is your 30-second speech? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to pick up with what Roberto said. I'm glad that I'm having this opportunity. I hope finally my dad will understand what I do because he, <laughs> he keeps saying to me, but wait, isn't the secretary general of NATO a Norwegian? And I said, yes, he's the secretary general of NATO. I'm the secretary general of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, so this is my chance to explain the difference as well. So um, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly was created separately from NATO, uh, but as a forum for members of parliament from Europe and, and North America um, to try to understand better the challenges that uh, both continents uh, face in terms of, of security and defense. Uh, and our secretariat uh, in Brussels uh, is kind of the only only, uh, you know, permanent presence of the assembly, the members are national members of parliament. There are your members of Congress here in the U.S., members of the Canadian parliament and members of various parliaments in, in Europe. And so uh, we, uh, the secretariat, uh, try to provide them with both uh, support in terms of policy, so give them the information that they need uh, to do their job as parliamentarians and have a greater say over defense and security. And also give them the information that they need to ensure that NATO is equipped and resourced to help keep citizens in Europe and North America safe. Mm -hmm. So that that's our job. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your your clients, the the the, po the politicians uh, who we refer to as parliamentarians. Who are these members who participate in your activities? Alexandra, why don't you start us off? 
So um, the profiles of our members are really very diverse. The first thing is they're all members of parliament in, in, in their uh, national capacity. So it is, yeah, you're members of the United States Senate, United States House of Representatives, uh, and then members of, of all the European parliaments. We have 29 member states uh, in the NATO Parliamentary Assembly currently, uh, soon to be 30 when North Macedonia joins uh, later this year. Um, the members who participate are usually members who are interested in security and defense. Sometimes they are experts, experienced members. Sometimes they are newer members who have an interest uh, in, in those issues. Um, and they want to be able to compare perspectives with their counterparts from, from other parliaments. But they're really varied. You know, Some are young, old, male, female, mostly male, I have to say for now, but, uh, uh, but it's changing. Um, some are, you know, former ministers, former heads of states, and they want to continue to influence a policy on security and defense. Some are up and coming, and, you know, they, they are hoping to use the assembly as a springboard. Um, Nancy Pelosi was one time a member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Joe Biden was, uh, John McCain. So, you know, you have, you have people that will go on and do great things afterwards. Sure. Roberto. Yes, uh, as uh, Ruxandra said, uh, they are members of the national parliament. Uh, so this is a big difference with other parliaments like the European Parliament where members are elected directly for that. Uh, in our uh, assembly, they uh, loan their time uh, three times a year, four times a year. They try to engage in election observation missions or in uh, visits, uh, but they're not permanently uh, assigned to the OSC Parliamentary Assembly. They are selected by the national parliaments uh, in uh, um, in proportion to the the, uh, the population of each country. So there are bigger delegations, uh, the U.S. and Russia in the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE. There are smaller delegations. We have small states. We have the Holy See in the Parliamentary Assembly. We have Andorra, Liechtenstein. Um, and um, the way they are selected really depends on each country. So each country decides. Normally, it would be uh, a mirror of the, the parliamentary reality of that country. So uh, proportionally to how that uh, country has uh, a majority, a minority, so they would send members uh, in that uh, number to our assembly. So in addition to the geographic diversity of the various national parliaments that are re represented in your various assemblies, you also have ideological diversity within delegations themselves. Is that right? Yes. Sir. That's right. We have in, in the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE also uh, political groups. Uh, you have uh, the European People's Party, you have the Socialists, the Liberals. These are political groups that are not formally uh, uh, constituted within the Assembly, but they, of course, are expressions of the political beliefs of our members. Uh, we have tried to uh, not to emphasize too much the political divide within the members because this is an assembly, especially the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, which extends between Vladivostok and Vancouver. So it has the Russians, it has the Americans, the Canadians, all the Central Asians, so it's very difficult to um, to qualify members uh, of a delegation from Kyrgyzstan ac according to the Brussels, let's say, divisions between uh, socialists and conservatives. Uh, what is very interesting is that when they participate to our meetings, they don't uh, participate as national delegations. You know, you would have people from the same national delegations who would vote on one issue in one way, and some members of the same national delegations would vote. And I would say, <coughs> if I may, Alex, um, that is actually this diversity in our membership is one of the great added value of our of our assemblies, uh, because unlike so NATO and the OSCE, uh, the governmental organizations to which our assemblies relate, the people who decide there are representatives of our governments, uh, U.S. administration, European governments. Um, our assemblies have yeah, members of the majority, members of the opposition represented. Uh, so sometimes the tone of our discussions can be somewhat different because, uh, you know, it is a parliament after all. And, and so you have uh, some somewhat more freedom in, in the type of discussions that we have. And the consensus might be quite different yeah. from what it is in the governmental organizations. Let me then piggyback off that word that you just used, consensus. It's my understanding that both at NATO and at the OSCE on the governmental side, meaning the heads of government, the ambassadors they have, they're working every week on these issues, any decision is made by consensus, really meaning if any member state or participating state in the OSCE context objects, 
that decision doesn't go forward. Can you tell me a little bit about how the Assembly is maybe different than that, Roberto? Yes. That's one of the biggest differences between the Parliamentary Assembly and the governmental side of the OSC. In the OSC, you have the rule of consensus. So the OSC can only say something as OSC if all 57 countries, 57 participating states, as we call it in the OSC, agree to it. So if uh, one government wants to say, today it's a sunny day, if it's an that one participating states does not agree with that. Uh, today, it's not a sunny day. And, and this is a challenge, of course. It's also maybe one of the strengths of the governmental side of the OSC. However, the Parliamentary Assembly is uh, lucky because we vote by a majority in our Assembly. And uh, this is one of the strengths, as you can see during uh, the uh, 2014 uh, crisis in Ukraine, the organization couldn't come up with a statement condemning what has happened in Crimea, while Ben Cardin's resolution in Baku uh, managed to to uh, call uh, for the clear, gross and uncorrected violations uh, by the Russian Federation to, um, to the Helsinki uh, final accords. So this is one of the strengths of this assembly that uh, you can have, uh, you can speak up, you know, while the government outside cannot always speak up. So Roberto, let me just underline that point that you make, because I think it's absolutely crucial. When Russia illegally occupied Crimea and is still there, yes. Because Russia is a participating state in the OSCE governmental side, that prevented that organization from making any kind of condemnation of this act, which really overturned the European security order. But the OSC parliamentary assembly, voting by majority, has been able to every year since then regularly condemn this, as you said, gross, uncorrected violation of the Helsinki Final Act principles that our regular listeners know is the foundation of what the Helsinki Commission and the OSCE are, are, are all about. Roxandra, can you give me a, an example about how the NATO Parliamentary Assembly might be able to, by majority, make a decision that might be more, or, or, or a statement, a political statement that might be more difficult from NATO itself, that Jens Stoltenberg, the, uh, the Secretary General of, uh, the other of, one. Uh, of the other <laughs> Secretary General, <laughs> wouldn't be able to get to. Please. Um, I think in our context, Alex, is, is maybe less um, that there would be a, a major divergence of opinion within the Assembly compared with, with what NATO says. But it, there are issues that uh, NATO as an organization doesn't discuss, but our Assembly would, because it would feel that, you know, it is an issue that affects um, transatlantic relationships, so affects Europe, affects North America. And it might not be a core NATO issue to start with, but our assembly members feel it's it's something important for members of parliament from Europe and North America to discuss. Um, one historic example has been climate change. Uh, the assembly has uh, talked about climate change and its impact on security already in the late 1980s, so way before um, you know it really came uh, to the forefront of the international agenda, and particularly for security organizations, because you know climate change is seen as an issue uh, from many different uh, angles. Uh, but the connection with security wasn't clear um, to, to many people for, for a long time. So this is, for me, one, one example where the Assembly has played this role of actually raising an issue that has then later on been picked up by NATO as, as an issue for them as well. If I can pick up on that, because it's very interesting, your question, uh, the consensus rule within the NATO PA and the OSC. Uh, one of the major differences, I think, within our organization is that, indeed, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and the NATO in general is a military alliance, but of countries more or less like-minded. You know, they have a common charter in the preamble of NATO. You abide to liberal democracy, rule of law. So somehow there is a idem sentire, we would say in Latin, you know, like a, a common view. In the OSC, um, the um, common values were agreed in 75, uh, in 1990, in the um, Paris uh, uh, Charter uh, of Paris. But I would say today these values, uh, though uh, um, countries have recommitted to them, would be very difficult to, to, to agree on those values today. And the biggest difference is that within the membership of the OSC, you have countries which are at war with each other. Yeah. Uh, clearly at war or undeclared war, but you have uh, um, Armenia and Azerbaijan, you have uh, Russia and Moldova, you have territories of Georgia being occupied by Russia, you have uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine on a daily basis uh, in, in a conflict, uh, you have uh, victims uh, every day in, in Donbass. So it's, uh, it's much more difficult to find a dialogue between members of parliament of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly because some of them and their governments are clearly at war with each other. So in in, in that type of context, Roberto, is it worthwhile to try to find areas of joint work uh, to not say consensus, but 
do you still talk about the issues that are difficult? Do the parliamentarians want to engage on these issues that prevent consensus? Uh, or is it really just about, let's say, easier issues where there might be more readily found agreement? Uh, thank you for the question, because I consider myself a bridge uh, builder. You know, I've worked in the Balkans exactly in putting together the Zambians and Serbs uh, in trying to find the solutions to their problems. So in the parliamentary assembly, we do try to do that. We do try to do that besides uh, the official uh, proceedings of the parliamentary assembly meetings. Uh, I have personally tried to put together the head of the Russian delegation together with the head of the Ukrainian delegations, uh, but not uh, in official meetings, but uh, maybe in uh, meetings outside the perimeter of uh, official OSCPA proceedings, uh, and they would talk to each other. Now, uh, if this discussion brings to uh, a solution to the conflicts, uh, that uh, is uh, to be seen, because, of course, uh, members of parliament uh, have some influence, but it's their government who then will decide on uh, the course of these events. I have uh, tried to put together the head of the Ukrainian and Russian delegation talking to each other, and they would, uh, to the more point uh, that it was a very pleasant conversation, right. up until the time when other members of their delegations would join them in the conversation. And I could see physically I was there between the two of them. And the moment other members of their delegations, maybe officials from the government came in, you can see the tone of their voices changing and uh, their rhetoric uh, returning to a very confrontational attitude. Yeah. So this shows, you know, that sometimes <laughs> you have to do things uh, outside of the normal channels of communication. I, I, I take your point on on really coming back to what you started with, which is you're, you're trying to create the conditions for at least the, the dialogue that's, that's, that's a central part of this. Let me shift us to um, a, a part of what we're talking about here, which is we've been able to establish that your assemblies, uh, because of the consensus rule, are able to advance positions that the governmental side finds more difficult, particularly on the OSC side, but let's say on the, on the NATO side as well. Um, how do the governmental side organizations, so again, not the parliamentary assemblies, but in the NATO case, the organization headed by Jens Stoltenberg, how do they react to uh, to the statements that come out of your respective parliamentary assemblies? How do your parliamentarians take what is their their rhetorical uh, devices, whether it's speeches or maybe documents that they might be able to agree or not agree on? How does that drive then the action on the governmental side? Please, Rooks. Um. I would say we we currently have a, a really a very close um, relationship with, with NATO. I think both us and NATO understand that there's great value in in the exchanges that that we have, and that allows our members actually to have more influence uh, also in in NATO discussions. I think from the NATO perspective, having an organization that brings together uh, 266 members of parliament uh, from 29 con countries. Uh, and having them as you know one interlocutor whenever they they need to talk to parliamentarians, they come to us, and and our debates will give them an indication of where collective parliamentary opinion or public opinion, because our members, after all, are representatives of their citizens, of where where parliamentary and public opinion lies. So I think you know that that fact uh, that we we give them that. Um, Means that they will listen to what to what the assembly says, and they will they will get a sense of okay, uh, is that is that a direction that that the alliance uh, should be going? Um, but there's there's really two ways that our assembly can can actually have an influence uh, is directly through through our conversations with NATO, and then through their work back in their national parliaments. So. Mm -hmm. It's good that the assembly adopts, you know, reports and resolutions, and we do. And and by the way, do have a look at those. You know, they're available on our website, and they have lots of really useful information. Um, but then it's important for our members to take them back the national parliaments um, and and act upon them. So whenever we recommend that NATO governments should do, I don't know, you know, uh, increase defense budgets, take an example, it's important that our members then bring this issue back and and push their colleagues uh, to actually discuss that back home. Yeah. Yeah. Roberto, tell me a little bit about the relationship between the OSC Parliamentary Assembly and the OSCE governmental side. The uh, governmental sides react to our uh, resolutions uh, in uh, different ways. Um, I would tell you, on a personal level, I have received many times ambassadors who have joined me after our um, statements or our, uh, annual resolutions saying, well, finally, somebody can say these things, you know, so off the record, they will tell you. 
we love it. We love that you can say these things. Uh, I would have loved to say this thing, but my government doesn't allow me or I cannot pass it as a decision of the permanent council because of the consensus rule. So it's yeah. great that the parliamentary assembly can actually speak up and say those things. Mm -hmm. um, what normally happens is that we have a, an, an annual session in July. We produce uh, three resolutions. We produce supplementary items. We produce documents on different issues uh, within the OSC regions and we present this uh, to the governments to the, the ministerial meeting of the OSC that takes place in December. Unfortunately not all these uh, resolutions can be adopted as documents of the ministerial council because of the consensus rule so they, you will always find a country that doesn't like of course to be criticized and will put a veto on that document but uh, uh, there are issues like for example a resolution of Chris Smith on anti-trafficking that was uh, recently adopted also as a, a ministerial uh, declaration so, so there are issues uh, where it will be also possible to have a consensus within the governmental side of the organization. But I very, very strongly believe that the organizations, not only the OSC governmental side and the parliamentary side, but also the other organizations should work together as a whole in order to deliver. Mm -hmm. Roberto, I'll just interject here. You mentioned Chris Smith, of course, a former chairman of the U.S. Helsinki Commission, longtime member of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly and a real leader on uh, international efforts on human trafficking, among a number of other issues. Uh, thank you for, for calling him out. Let me have a quick uh, shift again in our conversations because we've, we've, we've heard uh, indications of what the work actually looks like. And Roberto, you've mentioned a schedule of meetings. Ruxandra, you've mentioned re adopting reports and resolutions. Uh, Roberto, if I'm not mistaken, you've also mentioned election observation. This all sounds like quite a frenzy of activity. So let's make it a little bit more concrete. Uh, Ruxandra, why don't you start by explaining to us what exactly your main activities are? We've talked about the members of parliament that are participating. What are they actually doing? <laughs> Um, well, I would say that there's there's two things that they do. Um, the first one is, you know, they're parliamentarians. So they want to get together and discuss documents so that their collective opinion can be, uh, you know, enshrined in, in a resolution or, or a report. Um, so we have uh, two sessions every year, one in the spring and one in the autumn, uh, that bring together between 500 and 600 participants. And so over three or four days, uh, they will have discussions with experts um, uh, to, yeah, discuss what are what are the key challenges to security in Europe and North America. And then at the end of those of those days they will adopt reports and they will adopt resolutions. Uh, so that's one aspect of, of the work that we do. Uh, but then to gather information for those reports and for those resolutions, uh, our members also organize fact-finding visits. So they will go uh, to countries uh, in NATO or beyond NATO um, to actually meet with their counterparts in those parliaments, uh, meet with government officials, experts, uh, NGOs, uh, representatives of embassies and international organizations to try to understand the challenges that those, those countries face and try to feed that into uh, into their their discussions in in, in our sessions. Uh, so we organize. Besides those two sessions, uh, we have about thirty meetings that we organize wow. every year. Yeah. That's quite a busy agenda indeed. <laughs> but as an say, as an individual member of of the assembly, you would maybe participate to six or seven of those. So thirty five is our menu. But each individual member probably attends six, seven, eight. Activities yeah. every year. Tell me what these members are doing and what the schedule looks like. Our key um, uh, constraint and challenge uh, is our members of parliament are are busy, so uh, their their time is uh, you know the finite resource that we have we have to make the best use of, and so when we take them somewhere, we need to you know understand that during that time they are away from uh, their national business and they are away from their constituents. So when they come, is really about yeah working hard, uh, meeting as I said, meeting their counterparts in in parliaments, uh, meeting experts, uh, traveling sometimes to conflict areas. Uh, you know we've had delegations go to Afghanistan regularly at the time when when uh, when NATO was involved there with a big effort. It's still involved there, but at the time when it had 140,000 troops uh, deployed in Afghanistan, we've had delegations of members of parliament travel there uh, so that they can understand, you know, what exactly um, is NATO's engagement there and what it means for, for their countries and for their citizens. Mm -hmm. Roberto, I, I imagine the OSC Parliamentary Assembly also has an ambitious schedule of, of large meetings of hundreds of parliamentarians. Tell us a little bit more about how you organize the Assembly's work. 
We have also three uh, annual sessions uh, where members meet, gather and uh, produce uh, documents and resolutions. And as uh, Roxandra was saying, they like to discuss issues between themselves. But what I would like to also underline is all the other activities that we do. Mainly, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly focuses on election observation. This year only we will have 12 election observation wow. missions. It's members of parliament going to a country, assessing the election proceedings in that country and making a statement after it. Uh, under my leadership also... I thought it was very important to create uh, uh, committees that would deal with the current challenges that we have in today's um, global uh, political world, mainly terrorism and migration. So we've created uh, two committees on terrorism and migration to allow members uh, to engage further in details on these issues. The uh, Committee on Terrorism, uh, we went to Utoya, to Norway, uh, to see what happened uh, um, in 2011, in the 22nd of July 2011, a tragedy where 77 kids were killed by a, a lunatic, I'd say. Uh, but it's very important for these members also to see how other countries deal with the scourge of terrorism, what are the legislations that they adopt. So it's experience that members of parliament take also from other countries, the best practices of other countries, and then they try to bring them back in their countries. Uh, the advantages of being in a, a multinational parliamentary assembly is that a lot of legislations needs to be also transnational. Criminals don't stop at borders. Uh, actually, sometimes we should take example from uh, the very good uh, skills in cooperation that uh, criminals have, you know, like uh, and maybe uh, sometimes it's difficult for law enforcement of rule of law agencies uh, trying to uh, exchange information. So parliamentarians can be instrumental in that, you know, can uh, try to harmonize legislation to allow better information sharing. So uh, on migration, we've been at the borders of uh, uh, Syria and Turkey have been personally twice uh, to camps uh, organized by Turks in 2012 and 2015, immediately after the war in Syria broke up. Um, on climate change, we've been with a delegation recently in Svalbard, in the very north, uh, to see how... In the Arctic Circle. In the Arctic Circle, to see how the uh, climate change affects also uh, those uh, um, population, but also how it affects the entire issues of security besides the issues of economy. Yeah. So um, they engage also in activities of uh, conflict prevention. We have our members going to visit uh, areas in conflict, uh, try to um, activate uh, um, uh, activities of uh, uh, mediation between parties who are in conflict. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of activities besides the regular gatherings. It, it sounds like the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly that you lead it has evolved to take on uh, some of the emerging challenges, terrorism, immigration. You, you, you know, they, they've been with us for a long time, but clearly with a new prominence. Let me turn that question then over to Rexandra. Rexandra, tell us a little bit about how the NATO Parliamentary Assembly has changed over time to deal with new and emerging issues and how you think that might continue to change in the coming years. Um, well, in fact, uh, I think I was I was hinting at that earlier. Um, from from the very foundation of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly in in 1955, um, our founding fathers, the members of Parliament who created the Assembly, wanted it to have a broad agenda. Uh, they wanted it, you know, they wanted to allow members of Parliament to bring up any issues that could have an impact on the transatlantic. A relationship. And so that meant that from the very beginning when, you know, we created our first committees, uh, we had, for instance, committees on education and, and you know, the civil dimension of, of security. And that, that continues today. Um, obviously, uh, the, the focus of, of the assembly uh, changes as well with, with international events. Um, and so obviously, since 2014, our agenda is very much focused uh, on, uh, you know, Russia's uh, aggression against uh, Ukraine, against Georgia, uh, and its destabilizing activities around the world, uh, focus on, on terrorism, instability in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So all these issues are very high uh, on the Assembly's agenda. Now, going forward, uh, obviously, China is going to be uh, mm -hmm. uh, an issue uh, that the Assembly has obviously uh, discussed uh, in the past as well, uh, but it's now, you know, the focus on, on China's uh, ambitions uh, politically and militarily, uh, I think is going to grow within, within the Assembly. So watch that space. So you've both convinced me, and I think our listeners as well, that these Assemblies are hard work and they're hard work that produces a lot of value. I think another piece of evidence, unfortunately, that we have for that is that, uh, you know, some of our listeners who might be a little bit more familiar with the world of parliamentary assemblies might have seen headlines uh, not too long ago 
alleging some corruption at a sister organization, uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Now, I want to be clear with our listeners, neither of you here with me are representing that organization, uh, but clearly you're aware of this controversy. Uh, Roberto, I'd love to ask you to maybe fill our listeners in to more or less your understanding of what happened, and then maybe both of you could talk a little bit about how your assemblies reacted to uh, to uh, that uh, instance of, uh, let's say, uh, corruption. Yes. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Indeed, we are not uh, a representative of that organization, but uh, we are not happy about what happened in that organization. And I feel that uh, what happened is something that affects us all. Uh, there was a report on uh, instances of corruption uh, by Azerbaijan mainly, and it was called Caviar Diplomacy. Um, we have uh, not commented on the report itself, but we have tried to be reactive in the... Uh, uh, we have tried to, be, uh, to prevent something like this to happen within our parliamentary assembly of the OSC by putting together measures that would avoid uh, these uh, instances to happen with our assembly, mainly on election observation. So um, we've never had problems within the parliamentary assembly, but we thought it's better to make uh, more stringent rules in uh, the uh, election observation in way we select our members to do election observation, in the uh, way in which uh, we scrutinize uh, their backgrounds. So now members have to uh, fill up a form before they participate into an election observation mission by uh, self-declaring whether they have uh, an interest in the country where they observe an election, whether they have uh, conflict of interest with that country. Uh, of course, we cannot. Uh, uh, we don't have the capability to enter into too much personal questions about those members. But it's very important that the parliamentary assembly uh, gives itself some more stringent rules to avoid uh, episodes of corruption. Uh, it's very unfortunate what has happened in the Council of Europe. I know my colleague uh, in the Council of Europe uh, has uh, made. Uh, uh, a strong reaction from the Secretariat. They have put together uh, their own uh, new uh, set of rules, mm -hmm. and um, I think that uh, they are very solid to avoid these uh, episodes. Yeah. So. I mean, I'll, I'll just come back and, and, and to the point I was making earlier, which is if these uh, parliamentary assemblies didn't have some value, there would be no need for attempts to corrupt their work. Yeah. Uh, Ruxandra, uh, do you have anything to add on this issue? Um, yeah, so um, obviously that's that's uh, an issue that our assembly has has followed as well, and and we've also tried to react to make sure that we were also bulletproof to to anything uh, uh, that could uh, um, undermine the the credibility of of our work. Um, so Robert was mentioned the rules on election monitoring. Our assembly also occasionally participates in election monitoring, and we do so in close cooperation with the OSC Parliamentary Assembly and also the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and the European Parliament. And our members as well have to sign, you know, that that paper um, that says, yeah, we understand that, you know, as international observers, uh, we have to respect a, a number of rules uh, of, you know, impartiality. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a key uh, concrete measure that was taken indeed as a, as a result uh, of, of this case. Um, then I have to say our national parliaments as well have, have taken measures about, you know, accepting uh, hospitality from, from certain countries. So I think that that's, they're also more strict about what, what their members can do and cannot do when they travel. And then finally, we've amended our rules of procedure uh, to include uh, a provision about the removal of uh, elected officials within the NATO Parliamentary Assembly as well. Uh, so that's there as a deterrent. Uh, yeah, I hope we never have to use that. I see. But it enables the organization to remove a problematic individual exactly, member. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I see. I'll just uh, pick up on this because uh, it gives me the opportunity to talk about uh, this uh, plethora of international organizations that you have. You have the Council of Europe, you have the European Parliament, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, the OSC. And I think uh, Roxandra and I are pretty young in our jobs and we are new uh, uh, Secretary Generals. One of the things that I think I can speak also for Roxandra here we would like to introduce is more this concept that uh, all these organizations have to work together. And I think the the key to that is that uh, you have to put the focus uh, on who do we do all of this for you know it's the the citizens the um, citizens of the osc participating states the citizens of nato the end users i would say of the product uh, that we deliver yeah. and so if you have that in mind if you think uh, it, it gives a different type of meaning to what we do you sure. know because you say okay all i'm doing you know resolutions, meetings, statements, it's at the end of the day to make the life of that individual citizen better. Sure. And so 
once you focus on that, then you forget about the corporate identity. Of course, here I represent the OSC, she represents NATO, our colleagues represent the Council of Europe, but we're not in a competition. Sure. I, I, uh, Roberto, I, I, I take your point completely. I, I do want to, however, at the same time, realize that there, these organizations have different memberships with different sets of values that they bring to the table. And we've alluded to that a couple of times, which allows me to actually ask Ruxandra about another issue that a number of countries have with the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which is um, they, as a result of Russia's occupation of Crimea, the Russian delegation to the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe was disinvited. I'm aware that the NATO Parliamentary Assembly has in the past had a relationship with Russian parliamentarians. Ruxander, can you tell us a little bit about what that relationship has looked like, how it's evolved over time and where it stands today? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, actually very early on after the end of the Cold War, uh, the assembly opened its doors to Russia and other countries of the former Soviet Union. Uh, so we had a partnership uh, with Russia dating back 1991. Um, and Russia was participating in our meetings, not as a full member, because the full members are only NATO members, but as, as, as we call an associate member. But that meant that Russian parliamentarians could participate in almost everything that we did, uh, whether, you know, big sessions, seminars, those fact-finding missions that I mentioned earlier. And they did, and very actively so. <laughs> um, then came uh, 2008 and, and Russia's war uh, in Georgia, um, and following uh, following that, uh, the assembly decided to uh, adopt a number of sanctions against the Russian delegation. They were still able to participate uh, in our sessions, and we had a bilateral group uh, with Russia that continued meeting, uh, but they were excluded from a number of activities. Then 2014 came, and uh, Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea, and then our members said, okay, uh, this is not the first time. Um, and, and this is a serious escalation. You're talking about illegally annexing uh, another country. Uh, this was unheard of since the Second World War. And so they, they decided at that point to actually expel the Russian delegation. So no longer sanction, but actually expel uh, uh, the Russian delegation. So this is where we are now. Uh, we have no contacts anymore uh, with, with the Russian parliament. Um, our leadership um, is reviewing the situation uh, at regular intervals to see if there's any change in Russia's policies that would grant uh, the assembly changing its positions. And up, up until now, it's considered that it hasn't, that there's no grounds whatsoever um, to reconsider our position. So this okay. is where we are. Okay. Uh, Roberto. Yes. Um, as a consequence of uh, the Russians no longer participating in the uh, Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, uh, the entire delegation and the leadership of that delegation in the Council of Europe moved to the OSC Parliamentary Assembly. Mm. Uh, they've always remained in the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSC. They were not expelled. Uh, they listen to criticism, of course. Uh, they do not like some of our resolutions uh, that uh, we issue. But uh, in our Parliamentary Assembly, they have somehow always been... Um, present. They uh, use the occasion also to meet sometimes with the, the uh, delegations of the U.S., you know, so it's a, it's a place where we keep on uh, um, maintaining a dialogue uh, with the, the Russian delegation. Uh, dialogue is the uh, pillar of uh, our uh, organization. Uh, I often uh, travel with the president and we often talk to leaders and uh, the... Sorry, if the like, president yes, of the parliamentary, parliamentary assembly, assembly now, yes, George yes, Saratelli yes, in Georgia. Yes, yeah. And uh, the, um, if you like, the, uh, the, the thread, the uh, fil rouge, the, the main uh, gist of all our discussions always end up uh, with, uh, well, this conflict, this situation could be resolved if there was political will. And always the political will is addressed to one office, uh, one leader, or at least uh, a couple of leaders. And uh, the question that comes is, uh, how do you uh, um, forge political will? What are the tools that the international community has in order to forge political will? Is it sanctions? Is it uh, the technique of naming and shaming? So this is a bit what we do. You know, we issue resolutions. We, of course, call on the uh, um, violations of um, uh, our values by one participating state. Uh, 
But are these the only tools? Is it uh, just sanctions? Is it uh, naming and shaming? Uh, or is it uh, maybe what we use, dialogue? Uh, I would say a little bit of all of these things. Uh, dialogue, of course, has to be a dialogue that uh, leads uh, to some concrete measures. Uh, and uh, uh, within the parliamentary assembly, we very strongly believe also in engaging a dialogue uh, with uh, people with whom we disagree. Roberto, let me shift gears a little bit because we we... we a moment ago, we're talking about a national delegation. We had a conversation about the role of the Russian delegation, and I would be remiss in not asking you to talk a bit about the engagement of American members of the U.S. House of Representatives and the United States Senate, uh, both individually and uh, together as delegations to, to your respective bodies. What has U.S. engagement meant to the history of your organizations, and what has U.S. engagement meant in terms of the the work of the, the day-to-day work of, of of each of your assemblies? Roberto, I'd like to start with you, please. Well, the U.S. Uh, is uh, fundamentally in our organization. Uh, the founding founder of our organization, my predecessor, was uh, uh, chief of the Helsinki Commission, Spencer Oliver. And Sorry, if I might interrupt, uh, listeners uh, may may want to go back to the very first episode of this podcast where we had a significantly uh, very interesting discussion with uh, Spencer Oliver. So please okay. continue. Well, Spencer is an icon in, in our assembly. He's uh, basically written the rules uh, together, of course, with the members. But uh, he has uh, written in the, he suggested the language in the in the um, Charter of Paris on the establishment of a parliamentary assembly. So uh, is a person, so this shows how important was the U.S. in establishing the parliamentary assembly. But members of the U.S., um, the U.S. delegation to the OSC have had the leading roles. Uh, Alcee Hastings uh, was uh, the president of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly for two years. Current chairman of the U.S. Helsinki Commission. Correct. Uh, Senator uh, Roger Weaker is uh, our current vice president. Um, um, Congressman Hudson is uh, vice chair of uh, our terrorism committee. Chris Smith is a representative on uh, trafficking. Ben Cardin is uh, the uh, special representative of the president on issues of uh, tolerance and discrimination, anti-Semitism. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting other members, but uh, you, you've had a very, very strong presence of uh, the U.S. in our uh, in our parliamentary assembly. But not only uh, as individuals holding offices, but also as members setting the tone and uh, presenting values and representing values with their actions. I was very impressed this morning. We had a. a a hearing of uh, the OSC president, the OSC parliamentary president, and the NATO parliamentary assembly president, and one of the questions that Chairman Hastings brought up is, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, well, here in the U.S. we have some issues uh, with Guantanamo or with the death penalty, and um, you know, issues of uh, blackmail being uh, harassed by the police. Uh, does this make us less uh, morally? Uh, uh, outstanding uh, to present our values uh, at the uh, outside world. And I would say the very fact that uh, the question came from the chairman of the Helsinki Commission shows how important and how morally authority if authoritative is the U.S. Uh, uh, to the international world. So uh, I think the U.S. Uh, delegation plays an important role in the U.S. CPA. I would if I can make a little digression, as being a person who has worked in the Balkans, I've seen also the role of the U.S. in general in uh, conflict prevention and conflict resolution. So the fact that uh, today you've had uh, congressmen participating uh, in our uh, um, hearings uh, while there is uh, a lot of activities happening in Washington shows also the interest of the U.S. in international politics uh, in a moment where there is more and more the fear that the U.S. might uh, look more inwardly and not uh, participate very much into world politics. Roxana, do you see a disengagement by uh, the United States Congress in uh, your organization? Uh, certainly not. Uh, I mean, uh, the U.S. delegation uh, is is extremely active within within our organization. Uh, and to be very honest, there would be no NATO. There would be no NATO PA without without the U.S. And so we're we're very grateful uh, for the uh, time that the U.S. delegation is putting into our organization. Um, our U.S. delegation is currently led by by Jerry Jerry Connolly uh, and includes uh, bipartisan on a bipartisan basis. Um, 
experienced members uh, interested in foreign affairs and, and defense and, and, and experts on, on these issues. Um, Mike Turner uh, from Ohio is both a former president and, and currently a vice president of our organization. Uh, and obviously, he's he's also very experienced uh, um as as a, an elected uh, member of uh, Dayton, Ohio, uh, he brings in his also constituency perspective, uh, you know, of involvement uh, in the in the Western Balkans, and and also um, the fact that you know his constituency holds uh, one of the largest air bases in in the U.S. Um, I would say uh, is also. You know, our our members, our, our European members, are very grateful for the U.S. engagement, but they sometimes find it difficult to understand the constraints uh, that U.S. members of of Congress face uh, in in traveling to some of our meetings, um, and so you know, we we try to explain that you know. U.S. members face elections every two years. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in Europe uh, do you have a parliament that's elected every two years. And so uh, I think it's important uh, to really explain that to our Euro to my European members that when U.S. members come to our meetings, uh, it's actually, it is a big deal for them. Uh, and they're really making a point of showing their commitment to our organizations. And yeah. we're very grateful for that. Well, I, I would uh, – as, as, as I conclude, I, I, I would want to make sure that our listeners know that part of what they see in the, in the value of your parliamentary assemblies is exemplified in what they're proposing here in Washington. In particular, I'd, I'd raise the proposal that two of our most senior commissioners from the Senate side uh, from the Helsinki Commission, Senators Roger Wicker and Ben Cardin, have introduced a bill to strengthen the organization of American states by increasing the involvement of legislators in that organization. And it seeks to essentially create a parliamentary assembly for the Organization of American States patterned off of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, Roberto, that, that, that you lead. Um, I would like to thank you very much both for, for joining us on the, on the podcast today. It's been a really fascinating conversation. Um, before we go, I would like you very much to tell our listeners where they can go exactly to get more information on your assemblies. Perhaps some of our younger listeners would be interested in working for you someday. Please, Alexander, why don't you start? Yeah, thank you, Alex. That's great because, yeah, I did want to do a little bit of advertising. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned earlier, all the documents that the Assembly produces – are on our website. So go to www.nato-pa.int. And then on our social media, you can find all those from, from our website. Uh, these are is a great resource of information for anybody interested in security and defense. Uh, and then, yes, indeed. Uh, so we have an internship program um, for young master's uh, graduates. Uh, we take 10 uh, young, bright graduates every year to work for us. And they do actual work. We, uh, we wouldn't survive without our researchers. Uh, so I would encourage any, any uh, young uh, students, uh, you know, uh, interested in, in defense and in NATO uh, to have a look on our website and, and apply for the position. Well, from what I'm seeing from Roberto, they, you might have some competition for those excellent con candidates. Roberto, tell us a little bit about where, uh, where people can find out more about your assembly. I wouldn't call it competition because many of our research fellows have worked in both assemblies. <laughs> That's right. uh, so That's right. sometimes we take the best uh, students, uh, the best uh, addicted uh, to parliamentary diplomacy. Yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, of course, you find uh, on our website oscpa.org all the documents. Uh, and but we also have a, um, an internship program. We have uh, a JPO program, Junior Professional Program. Now um, we value very much the work of uh, young people. Uh, I myself was a former research fellow in '98. Uh, the Deputy Secretary General uh, Gustavo Pagliares is also a former research fellow. I think uh, I would say 70% of our staff are former research fellows. Mm -hmm. So we have a very young staff. Recently, we've hired a new staff who had done recently uh, an internship with us. So um, we like the program very much and we encourage young people to apply. Clearly. Well, Roberto, Ruxandra, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being here with us in Washington from Copenhagen and Brussels, uh, respectively. With that, listeners, we've come to the end of another episode of Helsinki on the Hill. We're always interested in hearing back from you with feedback. Get in touch via our website, www.csce.gov, our Facebook page, Twitter. We're all over the place. Thanks again for joining us on Helsinki on the Hill. Until the next conversation, I'm Alex Tierski signing off. Thank you.